Please mark number 179 for the invitation. 179. Then turn to number 408. 408.
godly people. As we look at this, and we, we looked at what James has read there, righteousness exalts a nation. And that's the basis of, of all political views within the Word of God, is that we must first off be righteous. We must pray for men and women to come into public office who are righteous, who will do things that are in the right way. Righteousness means being right with God. And if we are right with God, if they are right with God, then things will be done in the right way, and they will glorify God and not shame, as it says there, uh, the king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him who causes shame. And I look at us that way as we are the servants. Even though in a democracy or a, a constitutional republic as we are, uh, we officially control things, but it doesn't always look that way. But we as servants of God should look at ourselves in that respect that we are the servant. And if we are wise in what we do, then we can make the right decision and we can make wise decisions for God. But if we are not wise, then we call shame for God. When we look at this idea here of righteousness and politics, the nation which remembers God is a blessed nation. We uh, have the ability uh, in our lives, and, and I know for years I've heard the the excuse, I've heard the comment, well, what can one vote do? And it's not the fact that one vote can't do anything, it's that all of our votes together add up to be something that we can really make a statement for God. If a nation that remembers God is blessed, we have to understand the opposite is also true. A nation that forgets God is not going to be blessed by God. I hear so many times, you know, the people, and even in politics, outside of politics, wherever you're, you know, God bless the USA. You know, that's a wonderful statement. But I don't believe God is going to bless the USA unless we turn ourselves back to God as a nation and as a people. We can't expect God to bless this nation if this nation is going against what God is doing. So we need, we need to concentrate on grassroots efforts of, of getting to local politicians and encouraging them to, to be the right kind of candidates. And as that trickles up into other and higher offices, you know, this nation can be brought back to a, a, a land that truly glorifies God in what they do as, as far as our leaders go. I don't believe that we're hopeless. The Bible tells us with man it is, it is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. So I think if we really focus ourselves and try to to communicate to our leaders, whether they are representatives at the state level, at the national level, whatever, I think we can really make differences in our nation. What is your part in our nation? I want you to think about that tonight. How do you see our nation? Well, how you see it will probably hinge on what part you play in it. You know, if you are active in politics, even if it's just voting, you'll probably see the nation in a certain way. If you don't vote, you don't get involved, you don't really read the papers, you don't watch the news, and you probably see the nation in a different way. But as Christians, I believe we need to be involved. There was a group of uh, members of the Lord's Church back in the early 1900s. They were editors and publishers of the Gospel Advocate. And I think it's a wonderful magazine. I always think it has been. But there was a time back then where David Lipscomb <coughs> stood up and said, Christians shouldn't be involved in war, we should not be involved in politics, we should not vote, we shouldn't have anything to do with any of that, because it's tainted. And if we get involved in something tainted, we're going to become tainted. And I understand his idea. But again, I think the opposite is true. If we get involved in something that we know that is going the wrong direction, we can be the influence to make it go the right way. And that's the way I think we should look at it. Uh, again, I don't have anything against David Lipscomb. I don't think he was a wonderful commentator, a wonderful preacher. But I think at that time period, that was their, their mindset. And I think they had a reason for that. You think about what was going on in the early 1900s. You know, Europe and all the problems that were going on there. World War I coming into play. There was a lot of things going on that changed their minds about politics. But as with all things, we should go to God's Word to find out what it says. And let's do that. Proverbs chapter 11, if you will. If you'll turn with me. Proverbs chapter 11. What does it say about the righteous here? Well, verses 10 and 11, it says, 
When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there is jubilation. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. When you really look at verse 11, we see here some nuggets of information. By the blessing of the right, upright, the city is exalted. You know, as we are blessed, as God's people are blessed, a community is blessed. When we have the ability to work within our community and to serve God in this community, we can make a difference. That's what it tells me. We should not ignore the community around us. We should use the blessings that we have to bless other people. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. And boy, have we not seen that in our communities, in our state, and in our nation for so many years. When the wicked start to speak, things start going wrong. That's why we need to be the ones who are speaking. Now when we, Barbara and I, when we watch the news, we, we have seen for the last, especially the last, you know, six to eight, even ten years there, Things have been progressing in a, what we believe is a negative way to what we feel God would want us to do as a nation. And when we see it, you see the groups that are really being uh, exalted in the, in the world around us and in the nation and in the legal aspect, they're the ones who are <coughs> talking the most. It's like the old adage, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And if Christians just remain quiet, then we're not going to get anywhere. We need to let people know how we feel. Don't need to do it ugly. We need to do it with love like we do everything else in our life. But we need to let people know and stand up for what's right. Stand up for God's word and for God's will on this earth. Even if one ruling is unrighteous, God's people are still ruled by God. And that's what we have to hold on to. You know, we can think about, well, you know what, everything's just going wrong in this country. And, you know, we're just going to give up. We can't do that. Even if every rule and regulation, every law that is going on in this country is against God and is contrary to us and might even put us into, into persecution, we still have to understand that we are ruled by God. Our citizenship is in heaven first and foremost. Not on this earth. Not in Arkansas. Not in the U.S. Not in Arkansas. We must be ruled first and foremost by God because He is the one who will really handle the situations of this world. Someday he's going to end this world. We've got people, you know, and we have had in this world throughout the history of it, really, that have thought that they could rule the world, that they really thought that they could just take care and rule everything and, and be the, the chief over everything on this planet, but they can't. They never have and they never will. God is the only one who will ever rule this world. And Proverbs chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, listen to what Solomon says here about the righteous. He says, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge and, this, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. Come, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. You know, I hear a lot, and, and I've, I've, I've seen on Facebook, you know, so many people, many of them ministers of the gospel, and they post these negative ads on, on, you know, on politics, and it's just constant. It seems like a negative draw there. And I've gotten to the point where I just, I just delete them off because... I don't believe we should be staring at the negativity of this world. Because God tells me here, says he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. If I really believe that I'm walking uprightly, and if you believe you are, we must believe that God is our shield. That God will take care of us. It may not be on this side of Jordan, it may be on the other side, but God will take care of us. Persecution is going to come to Christians. We have that promise in the scriptures. But we have to understand that God will be there through it all. God will help us through it all. So we have to understand the righteous are continually going to be ruled by God. 
not by not by the people of this world who want to destroy God and who want to take God out of the equation. We also can look at those who rule. Look at Proverbs chapter 29, if you will. In Proverbs chapter 29, in verse 2, Solomon has this to say. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Bless you. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. You can think about what that says. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. And the people who rejoice are not just the godly people. Everyone will rejoice. Because God's way is better than man's way. It helps everybody when righteousness prevails in this world. Certain people, certain aspects of our community have been blinded to the fact, their minds have been blinded to the fact that righteousness is better. So they have allowed unrighteousness to prevail. But God explains to us that when righteous people are in authority, then everyone wins. And that's what we need to focus on. The, again, the idea is we need to be involved in the process of running our country, running our state, running our community. With the prevalent covering of sin in our nation right now, good leaders have been hard to find. They've been running for shelter, if you will. Because they don't think they can win. They don't think things are going to go their way. In fact, if you go back and you look back in last year, the end of last year, the first part of this year, when several men and women were talked about, or talked to, why did you not run? Why did you not try it? Every time you come out, every time that they came out, they said, we didn't think we could win. Because of the current feel of politics in this country. Again, we, I think, as, a, as Christians as a whole, I think we have been silenced because of certain things that have happened in our country. But we need to start speaking. We need to start letting people know that the righteous are, have not given up. That those of us who really care about this nation and care about God, first and foremost, are going to continue to speak. In Proverbs chapter 20, if you'd like to flip over there with me, look at verses 27 and 28. It says, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. Mercy and truth preserve the king, and by loving kindness he upholds his throne. So we see the righteousness that needs to prevail within our nation, needs to prevail within our leadership, that that is where true success will come, true victory of this nation will be. If we really want to have a, a nation that we can be proud of again, and the world will look at and understand that we are the home of the free and the land of the brave once again. We need to, to push the, the righteousness that we have within ourselves in God's Word. We need to push this into our communities and help people to understand the benefits of righteousness. And so in Proverbs 28, 16, Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 16, again Solomon says this, A ruler who lacks understanding is a great oppressor. But he who hates covetousness will prolong his days. We can see, not just in this country, but throughout the world, where there has been a ruler who has been oppressing his people or her people, they have lacked true knowledge. And that true knowledge, of course, is God's word. They have been those who have resisted listening to God. They have looked at God as just a, a mythical creature Something that really doesn't exist, that, that kind of is a crutch for those who, who don't have a, a backbone, who, are, who don't have the ability to stand on their own two feet. But that's not the way God is. God is the one who truly is in control. But those who truly oppress their people are ones who do not look to God. So we have to understand 
where they're coming from. They don't. They don't respect God. They don't reverence God. They may believe in God. Some of them do, but they don't really respect God like they should. We must also see here that by God they rule. People who rule are there because of God. Look at Proverbs chapter 8, if you will. We'll look at this and then we'll break this down a little bit. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. He says, By me kings reign, and rulers decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles, all the judges of the earth. So we have to understand here. We have to see, okay, you know, we scratch our heads and we say, we've got rulers that are not godly. They're not looking toward God. They're not focusing on God. But God has allowed them to be there. Why is that? Why would God do that? Because he gives us free will is the easy answer. We have the free will. We put somebody in or we allow somebody to be put in, then he's there because God has allowed that to happen. Because we have, he has given us the right to choose who we want as leader. We have blessings in this country that many countries have never had the right to vote. God has never given up his reign over this earth, though. Many have desired, as I said, to rule the world. Some thought they were going to be able to do it. Charlemagne, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin. Some of them thought they had control over that, that they would eventually control everything, but they never did. No one ever will. But God, He rules, He will rule, and He does rule. When you think about the idea that God has put these people in or allowed them to, to reign, turn with me to the New Testament, to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 12. 13. We see here. Verses 1 and 2. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So not only do we have God putting or allowing these people to put in, but he's also now explaining to us in the New Testament that we have to be subject to these people. How can we be subject as righteous people to men and women who are unrighteous? And of course, we don't allow ourselves to be bought into the error and the evilness of it. We do have the right to stand up if they contradict the will of God. We do have the right to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to go along with that because that's not the way God wants me to live. But as long as they are governing us in a way that is not contrary to the will of God, then it's our responsibility to listen to them and to abide by them and to allow ourselves to be governed by them. And sometimes it's very hard when you don't agree with a leader's philosophy or policy. But as long as they're not violating the will of God, we have no right not to submit to them as the authority over us. If we do, as it says, therefore whoever resists the authority resists God. And that's what we don't want to fall into. We don't want to get to the point where we are resisting God. So even at this point, now we can say, okay, maybe <coughs> Maybe they don't realize just how bad we've got it. Maybe Paul couldn't foresee how things were going to be in the world in 2016. Well, you know, he couldn't have, but God could have told him. But let's just turn the dial back a little bit to when Paul wrote this. Nero was on the throne in Rome. Nero was one of the most vicious, brutal rulers that Rome ever had. One of the most heinous, murdering, really criminals, if you want to look at it. He kills his own people. He kills his own family if he wanted to. And he thought they would get in their way. In fact, 
There were a few instances it was reported that he did kill part of his family because he thought they were trying to overthrow him. Nero was, you know, if you took some of the people that I stated, Napoleon, and you take Hitler, and you take Stalin, and kind of mix them all together, then you might have Nero. And that's when Paul wrote this. Because guess what, people? Even at that type of persecution, every soul is to be subject to the governing authorities. So as we look at this in, into the, the political realm here, as God's people, we can't just say, well, I'm not going to do what these people tell me to do. If, again, they explain to us that we do something against the will of God, then we don't have to do it. But as long as they are not violating the will of God, then we must be in subjection to them. If they can say that at the time of Nero, we can say that today. Because we haven't gone anywhere near where they were. <coughs> there are countries in this world that have been far more abused and oppressed than we have ever been. And they still can't even touch where Nero was. So we need to understand and put it on in perspective. In Proverbs 28, verse 5, Proverbs 28, verse 5, Solomon wrote, Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand all. And that's what we have to, again, we have to understand. The people that we may be opposing at times in, in politics, if they're really truly evil, as Solomon is saying, they don't understand justice. They don't truly understand God's justice, what he's saying. I always thought this was interesting when I, when I look at these verses that deal with politics and leaders in the book of Proverbs. This is written by who? King of Israel, the leader at that time. He is scrutinizing himself as he goes through this process, he is pulling out his own warts, if you will, and exposing them to everyone who's going to read this book. Because there was times in his life that he was very faithful to God, and there were many years in his life that he was not. That he would have considered himself, and probably did when he wrote these things, the evil men who lead the world. Because he did things that were completely against the will of God. But we understand where he's coming from. And that helps us to understand things. Then there are those, as he states here, evil leaders. Look at Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. And verse 23. It says, A wicked man accepts a bribe behind the back to pervert the ways of justice. The integrity of our leaders is important. When people find out that there's one, one discrepancy in their integrity, if there's one lie, if there's one wrong move that they make, it will erase the rest of their ability to lead and to be respected. Because when there is one lie, one error, you, you, you don't know what else to believe. There is no standard of how you can believe. So evil leaders are those who they, they are hard to respect because there is so much evil in them. There are so many lies that they have committed. There is so much criminal activity, if you will, in their past. It's hard for people to respect them. But we have to understand all this. As we put all this together and we, we concentrate on what we've looked at and we look at this and you can say, man, this is a bleak thing, right? <laughs> How can we ever pull out of this? How can we ever have anything to do with this? As I put all this together, I want us to think of one thing. And, and if you want to turn to this, you may. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want us to concentrate on this verse. Or these verses, I should say. There'll be two of them there. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. We'll have this, and then your lesson will be yours. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, 
intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. You know, when I, as I put this lesson together, I didn't, I didn't have that verse on there. I put it together Friday morning, as I usually do for my Sunday evening service. But I spent some time thinking about it over the last two days. And I thought, you know what? It's easy to get up and to say, well, you know what? Some of our politicians are, are wicked. Some of them are evil. You know, we need to get out and vote. We need to do all this kind of stuff. But you know what? There's one thing that I don't do enough of. And maybe you guys don't either. And that's pray for them. One thing that we can do is to pray for kings, for those in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in godliness and reverence. Do we really spend a lot of time in prayer for our leaders? Do we pray for the leaders here in our community? Do we pray for our governor and our state house? Do we pray for our president? And Congress. It's easy to get up and complain. You know. We, we have this idea that, well, you know, as long as you vote and everything, you have the right to complain. And that may be true. But as a Christian, we need to do more than just complain. We need to be in prayer for our leaders. Because if we're not, we may not say that part of the, the, the evil that's going on is our responsibility. I don't have to go that far, but I do know this. If we're not praying for our leaders, we're not doing what God has told us to do. We need to be in prayer. And as we come up on this election, I think we need to spend more time in prayer that things go the way God wants them to. Not just the way I want them to, or the way you want them to, but they go the way God wants them to. That we can learn to be submissive to our leaders, and especially to God, that we can learn to be the kind of people that we need to be, first and foremost for God, but we can show the world around us what it means to be a Christian. But we need to be on our knees, bowing before God multiple times for the leadership in this world. If you need the prayers of this congregation, we'll be happy to pray with you and for you. If you're here tonight, you're not a child of God. If you don't have the right to pray to God as a priest because you've never had your sins washed away, we can assist you tonight in having your sins washed away. You can put on Christ in baptism. Walk out of here and be able to communicate with God on your own and know that He will listen to you. He may not always give us exactly what we want, but he will give us exactly what we need. If you have a need tonight, you'll come down as we stand. Sir. God is coming, the bridegroom come without delay.